Let's take a look now at a few special types of integral domains. If we've got an integral domain d, we're going to call it a unique factorization domain if every non-zero element of d that's not a unit can be written as a product of irreducibles and the factorization into irreducibles is unique up to associates and the order in which the factors appear. And a simple little thing here, which I'm not going to prove, is that every principal ideal domain is one of these unique factorization domains. Obviously, the inspiration for this is z. Because if you take a number, say 24, we can break that thing down as 2 times 2 times 2 times 3, where those are all irreducibles. Now, this whole thing, it's not completely unique because I could do something like negative 3 times 2 times negative 2 times 2, and it's effectively the same. Again, it comes back to these things being associates. The order can change, and things can be a unit off from each other, but otherwise we're fine. Similarly, if I have something like r of x, that's going to be a unique factorization domain. Again, that goes back to really all the stuff we were doing in the previous chapter. Now, working from this theorem, every principal ideal domain is a unique factorization domain. Well, one of the things we said was that if we started with a field and then created a polynomial ring, that that was a principal ideal domain. So, when we have a field, f, the polynomial ring created from that field has to be a unique factorization domain. That gives us the r of x, it gives us q of x, it gives us c of x, all those things have to be unique factorization domains. And even things like z2x, z5x, all these things have to be unique factorization domains. Now, another thing here is what we call an, uh, an Euclidean domain. We got a function d called the measure, and the reason they use d is for distance, is what they're kind of implying. We've got a function that goes from the non-zero elements of d to the non-negative integers, such that d of a is less than or equal to d of a, b, for all non-zero a and b in the domain. And if we have two elements in the domain, with the second one not being zero, then we can do sort of a division algorithm thing. So there exists elements q and r such that a equals bq plus r, where either r is zero or the measure of r is less than the measure of b. Once again, the integers are one of the inspirations for this. If I say that I've got a function d from the non-zero elements of z to the non-negative integers, and we're going to define that to be d of a is the absolute value of a. Okay, so first of all, if I take a number, say, and I'll just do a specific example, 3, I don't care what I multiply that by, the absolute value of 3 has to be less than the absolute value of that. And again, this is specific to z, because if I were allowing fractions, this would certainly not be true. But, because in z, 
the absolute value of AB is equal to the absolute value of A times the absolute value of B. And the absolute value of B has to be greater than or equal to 1. It has to be greater than or equal to the absolute value of A. Easy enough. Also, again, we've got long division type things. So we know we can do this division algorithm. We know we can create this quotient and remainder for anything. Similarly, if we had something like R of X, Once again, we're going to say my measure function going from the non-zero polynomials to positive integers, actually non-negative integers, and it's going to be d of a polynomial is equal to the degree of that polynomial. Now, we have to be a little bit careful here because we can have polynomials of zero degree. But, in that case, it's still the case. If I have A is just a number, the degree of A is zero, and that's going to be less than or equal to the degree of a times any other polynomial. So that's fine that way. And if I take two polynomials, the degree of p of x is certainly less than or equal to the degree of p of x times q of x. You can add to the degree by multiplying by another polynomial, but you can never subtract from it. And again, we know we've got this division algorithm kind of thing. We did that specifically before. So we know that this thing is going to be a Euclidean domain. Now, with this idea of a Euclidean domain, every Euclidean domain is going to be a principal ideal domain. Also, every Euclidean domain is going to be a unique factorization domain. Once again, it kind of comes down to if every Euclidean domain is a principal ideal domain, and we said before, earlier, every principal ideal domain is a unique factorization domain, that corollary easily follows. Now, one interesting thing is that we start with a unique factorization domain and we create the polynomial ring based on that unique factorization domain, we get another unique factorization domain. 